In the last video, we took a look at Steve McCurry's Afghan Girl, and after I did that video, it's something that just I kept thinking about, and there were some really wonderful comments, and somebody actually left a link to a video, and I went and watched with Steve McCurry, and I'll link it up at the end of this one. I would highly recommend checking it out, but it's Steve McCurry talking to a group of people, I think it was in 2010, about making that picture, and when I was looking for a, a version of this picture to put in the video, I found a second version that's an alternate, and I want to show that to you. It's also really incredible. It's intense. It's just not quite as good as the other one. And it's interesting because he talks about both of these and the process in this video. Now, our series here that I'm doing is really based on the intention of a photographer. And we looked at Afghan Girl from the standpoint of color and composition, and also a little, some side notes about how iconic that image had become over the years. And it's interesting because I'm realizing at this point how broad a topic intention of a photographer really is. It goes way beyond color. It goes way beyond composition. And I think this is a really good example of this. The story and the gist of it, and I think the important part that I want to share with you guys is this. So Steve McCurry was on assignment in Afghanistan, and he that day was working with a group of school kids. And one of the kids that was running around was the Afghan girl, and he noticed right away the intensity of the eyes and knew that's what he wanted to capture. So if you really look at this intention of the photographer going from start all the way to the final magazine cover, this is where it begins. And it's really interesting, the process. He, he took some images of the other kids, shot off five or ten. You know, they were very limited on time. And then when he sat that girl down, was able to get the intensity of the eyes, but really wanted the face. And there are some pretty big barriers, uh, I think, culturally that he had to get past to do that. For instance, a young girl showing her face to a white photographer is pretty taboo. The school teacher apparently helped with this a little bit, and literally it was one shot, and then she got up and ran off to play with her friends. He said, in the meantime, he went on, he sent the film back to Washington, it was sent to Georgia for processing, and he went on to do other things. And... Um, did some other photo assignments. A couple months later, he comes back to National Geographic and sits down with the photo editor. And they're going through, and he realized how intense the shot came out and how happy he was with it. And so he said, well, this is the shot. The photo editor said, no, it's way too intense and way too scary for us to ever use as a cover. Another thing I want to make a comment on is typically uh, with magazine publications like that, especially National Geographic in the 80s, is they didn't really say, okay, here, go shoot the cover. Uh, they would look at all the imagery they had, and they would decide based on that what would be on the cover. So just because because you shot something didn't mean it was going to be a cover images. So they took the images and he he thought, well, we got to show it to the to the magazine editor. I don't want to not show it. And so what they did was they reached an agreement that they would show the other image that I just showed you a minute ago first. And so this would be the one they would sell. And they would also put the famous image in there too. He said they went into the magazine editor and he looked at the first one and said, wow, this is great. Looked at the second one. He leapt up and said, this is the cover. And that's also one of the most famous covers that magazine ever did. It's, it's phenomenal. And it's an incredible image, and it's a fun story to kind of like go research and look at. I'm going to link it up here. But it brings me back to what I really um, wanted this series to be when we're talking about the intention of a photographer. And it's a lot of things. And I know yesterday we were talking about, I decided to take that from the standpoint of what's going on with color and composition and and how that is relayed through the process. And it's interesting to me because you can clearly see when Steve's talking about this that those things are not really at the forefront of his mind when he's getting the image. He's in a high pressure situation with very little time. It's not like a studio setting where you can sit there and work with it for a while. Uh, and he's not dealing with makeup people or any assistant. I mean, it's just very raw and very quick and very fast when the whole thing happens. And this is where I think the brilliance of really good photographers comes out, is that composition, color theory, those are not things you're thinking of in the heat of the moment when you're in a situation like that. There's just no time for it. And it's like a lot of things in life. I mean, you know, like if I'm driving my car, I've got a stick shift, right? And I can't be thinking about where the brake and the gas and the clutch and all five gears are when I'm trying to pay attention to other drivers. Uh, how fast I'm going? Am I getting there on time? Is there anything that's dangerous I need to look out for? There are other things that have to occupy your, your, your brain space when you're in that position. You've got to understand how to operate the car and it has to be second nature. Maybe that's a little oversimplified, but you know, I think maybe a better way to look at it is like, I've talked about this a lot before, but like jazz music and jazz musicians. And I look like at Miles Davis or John Coltrane, some of the best and some of these amazing figures in history that I look up to. And to understand jazz music and to improvise around a solo you have to not only understand basic music theory, you have to understand uh, scales, you have to understand arpeggios, how all that works, but you also have to know the chord changes of the song that you're playing over. You also have to understand 
the melody of the song. And really good jazz musicians understand the history and other versions of that song that might exist. And that way they have something informed that they can improvise and create something intelligent over the top. But my point is, is that the intention of a jazz musician, when you're right there, you're not thinking of these music theory concepts and you're not thinking, you're thinking about structure and how you're going to react in the heat of the moment. What are the other musicians doing? And so I think that this style of photography, there are a lot of similarities there because you simply cannot be thinking of those things at the point of impact. You've got to be able to react and you've got to be able to get the shot. And this is a case where it worked. I think another thing that comes to mind that's interesting too is that it's a lot. And some of the best photographers, and I've had a really nice opportunity to interview some of my heroes, and the best ones that are humble will admit that they don't always get the shot. Keith Carter admitted that to me several times, uh, Bill Wegman. I mean, it doesn't always happen, but when it does, that's when the magic takes place. And you've, there, there's a certain amount of knowledge that you have to have internalized to go there. So was Steve McCurry, when he shot the African girl, looking for like these shades of red and green? Well, no, not in the moment, I don't think, but I think in the back of his mind, he's always photographing like that. I think he, whenever he does portraits, and Steve McCurry is a great portrait photographer, but he's always looking at those elements Elements, and then therefore they kind of become second nature after you've gotten enough experience. So this whole idea of the, uh, of the intention of the photographer is something I keep saying, it's a lifelong journey. And I've also realized that, you know, I kind of went at this when we were looking at how to deal with color and post-production and some of those things and realizing that intent. And I'm realizing that what we're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm saying realizing a lot, is realizing. The realization is only part of the intent. There is a whole nother broad scope of that process that goes into it. I'd love to hear what you guys have to think. I know I said it'd be a week before I did this again, but I just, I couldn't quit thinking about Afghan Girl. There were some great comments in that video yesterday, so I just wanted to follow up on that. So anyway, leave your comments down below. I'll see if I can get back with you. And until the next video, I'll see you guys then. Later. Later.